My name is Kyle Pivato. I'm the uh, superintendent of the Sports Broadcasting Contest. And this is my first year doing this. Uh, I've been a judge in the past, but uh, they hand out the contest to me this year. So um, some of your questions I, I might have to do some research and get, you, get back to you for. So uh, uh, just let me know and I'll do my best to answer what I can. Um, sports broadcasting, um, typically you have you know two teammates sitting in a room watching a, a yeah, a monitor of a of a sporting event, and they do their commentary for about eight minutes. But this year, it's going to be it's going to be different. But uh, I think it will still be a quality co contest. Um, I made a PowerPoint I want to go through that I think uh, I think can answer a lot of questions and also supply a lot of tips. Uh, just waiting for that to load right now. There we go. Okay. The um, now I want to tell you a little bit about my background. I um, before I came to the Ag Center and worked in the communications department, I was a newspaper reporter, a journalist for a long time in Texas and in Louisiana. My last job, I worked at the Advocate newspaper in Baton Rouge for more than five years, and there I covered a lot of things, but uh, mainly I wrote kind of feature stories that were kind of happier, uh, usually. Uh, happier stories or stories about health or entertainment, things like that. But uh, when I was in college, I did take a sports journalism class, and part of it was on sports broadcasting. I learned enough to know that I wouldn't be very good at it. But uh, I did have some friends who who would practice sports broadcasting. When we went to cover games, they would sit in the bleachers uh, uh, or in the seats uh, kind of farther away from the rest of the class, and they would and they would do their commentary into a microphone or into a tape recorder, because this was a while ago. And they would just record it, and then they would go back and listen to it and, and uh, talk to the uh, professor about how they did. But uh, So anything I learned about sports broadcasting, I mostly learned from them. But uh, here's a quick introduction. Uh, so sports broadcasters provide live coverage of sports to capture the events of the game for viewers and listeners. Uh, most broadcasting, most sports broadcasts have two people, uh, a play-by-play -play commentator calls the action. And that's usually the guy with the good radio voice, the one who speaks very over the top and uses his deep voice whenever possible. And, you know, and he describes the play as it happens. And these guys are usually the professionals. They're the ones who have come up from you know, minor league baseball or something. And they've worked on the radio and they work on TV. And that's all they've ever done really is play by play. And there's often another person, the color commentator. And the color commentator analyzes the game and uh, provides some expertise to help viewers better understand what's happening. And a lot of times these are former athletes, former coaches, people who are experts. And they can tell people, they can tell the viewers or listeners things that the play-by-play -play broadcaster just doesn't know. And, you know, the play-by-play -play broadcaster will sometimes uh, kind of some, ask the, the color commentator some questions and say, well, why are they doing this? Why, why would a coach do this right now? And they, they kind of help them, you know, go them along to, to, uh, to fill in the gaps there. Um, there are some events, especially really big events that we see, like, uh, ESPN Sunday Night Baseball, they have often two color commentators in the booth. Um, they'll have uh, Alex Rodriguez and another another commentator, and they'll cover multiple aspects of the game. Um, here are some prominent people you probably know if you watch sports. You know, Joe Buck, he does the World Series. He does Fox NFL. He, you know, he does all kinds of things, and he comes from a long a long line of sports broadcasters. Uh, his dad was well known for being a play-by-play -play guy for the St. Louis Cardinals for years. And people, you know, people who are big baseball fans have known him and his dad, you know, for decades. And Bob Costas, he started out as a as a guy on a local station in Chicago, and and now he's, he was the voice of the Olympics for a really long time. And that's how, who we how we mostly view him as the the guy who did the Olympics. And um, but he also did Monday Night Football. He had a lot of different things. Uh, and then Mike Tirico is a, he's around a lot now. You see him 
on ESPN. But now you, you uh, see him mostly on ABC. He does a lot of football, just a lot of big events. He's maybe maybe taking over for uh, you know someone like Costas because I, I think he was doing some Olympic coverage before. But uh, these are some of the well-known play-by-play broadcasters. And, um, and you know, every sport has one or two people who are um, really associated with the sport, but some people can do multiple sports. Now, um, these are a couple of people you might know who are color commentators. Uh, Jessica Mendoza, she, I think she works part-time for the New York Mets, but she was a softball player, and she became, you know, one of the first women to uh, be a color commentator on a sporting event that's, you know, mo- for a sport that's mostly played by men. And she, she's been on Sunday Night Baseball for a couple of years now. And uh, the other guy, he's Tony Romo. He's former quarterback for the Dallas Cowboys. And he's, uh, he's been really heralded for his ability to step in and be a color commentator. Color commentator. Uh, uh, it, I'm getting some feedback. How, is there a way to easily fix that? Yeah, I just muted that person. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, Tony Romo was a, a you know high level NFL quarterback for a long time, and then he stepped into the booth and became a very good uh, color commentator uh, in his first year because people uh, people love the fact that he would predict plays and things like that, and that's what you're looking for with color commentators. You're looking for people who can. Uh, really make the viewer understand what these high-level athletes are doing because they're doing things we could never do, uh, even at our best. And they're, they want you to go inside their heads. They want you to you know, tell how they're feeling, if they're stressed, or, if they can, uh, or what they might be trying to accomplish here. And so the color commentator can just tell us things, background that, we, that the play-by-play person doesn't know and uh, that, the color, that the play-by-play person really can't. Uh, express. So those are the two people we have in the booth, typically play by play and color commentary. Okay. So here are the basics for the contest. Uh, like we talked about, one contestant will broadcast play by play. The other will be the color commentator. The contestants must commit to one role throughout the broadcast. You really can't switch back and forth. Now, occasionally, radio broadcasters, you will see them switch back and forth because play by play. It's harder. Uh, it's harder sometimes, especially on radio, because you have to say everything. You have to talk constantly, and um, you know the color commentator kind of fills in the gaps. But uh, so sometimes they'll switch back and forth. One will do an inning of baseball. The other, the other will do the other inning of play by play. They'll switch back and forth. But in our eight minute broadcast, we're not going to do that. We have to have people commit and just focus on one skill. Um, the the teams, the, the contestants, will be able to pick which sport to call, football, baseball, and basketball. Uh, we will probably have a football clip, a baseball clip, a softball clip, and a basketball clip. That way that, and basketball will probably be a women's basketball game. That way that we have uh, two men's sports, two women's sports. And uh, the sports clip won't be available until the co- to the contestants until the contest begins. Okay, uh, that way, the contestant is calling it like it's live. The contestants have never seen it before. They can't memorize the plays or anything like that. And so it's, it's really in the spirit of real sports broadcasting. And uh, the clip will be shared over the video chat. Um, so uh, the teams will be given general information about the teams and players. For example, the, you know, in other words, like the rosters and background information about the teams before the day of the contest. So they can examine the rosters they can get to know the person's name the the players names and they can work on pronouncing them correctly and uh you know what positions they play and things like that and they can have some background information that we're going to give them about the teams about the venue and things like that so they'll know like their rec the team's records before the game and where the where they're playing and where they're from and things like that and the this isn't in this in this chat, or it's not in the any of the materials, but you know you can these you can make up uh, details or facts about players about teams. You can just make you can make some things up just to fill in some information. Tell us the kind of things that 
play-by-play announcers or, or color commentators would tell us in a game because they're going to tell you like some little stories like you know um you know robert rodriguez gets up to bat he's hitting uh 385 this year and has a really good season but he's coming back from uh acl surgery and he thought he would never play again he thought he might not be able to finish his high school career because of his knee injury or something like that you know and you can just kind of give us a little background and as long as that's consistent in the broadcast you know you're not making it up on the spot but like you've made up a story that you can assign to a specific player and just and you know and not switch it around as long as it's consistent within the broadcast that's great it uh because these play-by-play announcers and color commentators they have producers who are who are acting as reporters during the game and they're going in and they're you know talking to the players talking to the coaches and they're learning things about them and then they feed that information to the broadcasters so you don't have that that uh that reporter out there doing the work for you so you can just kind of make up some stuff you know and that's perfectly fine for this contest uh, and i think that would be that would really enhance the broadcast too uh, especially for a game like uh football or soft or i mean baseball or softball it moves slowly and there's a lot of room to fill in the gaps so you can fill in the gaps with some background information like that and you know just be a little creative uh the teams will be required to call about eight minutes of game and uh, at the end of that eight minutes, we will have a short commercial break and we'll give you a commercial script and it'll just be a few seconds of, uh, I haven't written the script this year yet, but in the past it's been a short, probably 30 seconds, less than a minute, depending on how quickly you read it, uh, script. And uh, I would like to kind of show you an example of, of one of these uh, commercials uh, at the end of this, after the PowerPoint, I found one on YouTube that I think is kind of, uh, it's, it's about 20 years old and, uh, it's kind of, it's kind of funny now, but it's, but it's basically the formula that you should follow. But, um, okay. These are some tips that, uh, I've kind of gathered and the previous superintendent gathered and, uh, they're, they're from people who have called games before. So the tips to, to be successful in this contest are contestants need to, they need to watch a lot of games and be familiar with the pace and action of the game they're calling. They need to know the language of that game. If you know, you know, baseball and you mention that someone, uh, the pitcher, the pitcher didn't allow the other, the other team to score a run in the last game, you need to know what that's called and you know it's called a shutout because the listeners of baseball expect you to know the language of the game, you know. Um, so uh, that's that's really important is to be able to call the game, be familiar with the language of the game, and uh, listen to a lot. Listen to the games when you watch them. Listen to the phrases they use. And how do the how do the two announcers work together? How the color commentator and the play by play analyst like how do they work together, right? How often do they say the score of the game and where the game is? How often do they fill in lulls in the game? They, if you watch, especially on radio, if you listen to radio, because it's fun to watch, listen to baseball on radio, especially. And I know a lot of people listen to football, you know, on radio, even watching the game. Sometimes they'll turn off the volume and listen to the radio guys because they're they're really descriptive. They describe everything they can think of, everything they can see, and they report repeat the score all the time, constantly. And that's important because if someone tunes in, in the middle of a game. They need to know what the score is. So every every minute or so, they repeat the score, and they repeat probably where, often where they're playing. Uh, we have a later on. I want to listen to a few minutes of a uh, of a uh, football game that is a radio broadcast of an LSU Tigers game, and they repeat the score and they repeat the location constantly throughout the game, and uh, and that's that is important. And for this event, we want people to kind of call the game like they're on the radio. Be descriptive and let the listener know what's really happening. Um, radio broadcasters especially, they will say, you know, the, the Texas Rangers take the field. They're wearing their home white uniforms with Texas, with Rangers across the chest in uh, block letters. And they'll, they'll, they'll describe the day, the weather, 
they'll describe the playing conditions and how wet or dry the field is. And they'll also describe the uniforms. And you expect fans to know the uniform, but you know, several, most teams, especially professional teams, they might have five uniforms. So they kind of describe them for them. They, they, list, they try to paint a picture. And that's what we want people to do in the contest is really paint a picture. Even though, even though it is, a, uh, you're watching a broadcast, we want people to still paint a picture of what they're seeing. So um, in order to get familiar with this, watch sporting events. On, and because of the pandemic, there aren't many live sporting events. And it's, so that, that does make this a little harder. But you can go on YouTube and you can look up uh, whatever sport you like and you can find uh, old games. And a lot of times the ones you find on YouTube are kind of the, some of the better, uh, better play-by-play people, you know? Uh, the ones I've looked up for, for examples, they're often like Vin Scully, who, is, who retired recently as the voice of the Los Angeles Dodgers, but he called games for decades, for you know, 50 or 60 years, I think. And he called for the Brooklyn Dodgers. And the, when they moved to Los Angeles, he became the play-by-play guy for the Los Angeles Dodgers. He would do radio and TV. And he would call other games, too. Uh, he's kind of a legend. So if you're going to learn from somebody, it's, good, it's great to learn from somebody like him. Or uh, John Miller is a great baseball announcer. You know, uh, we talked about Joe Buck and some of the guys that do football. And uh, you can just learn from them and learn how quickly they, they call the game. Like the manner in which I'm speaking now, I'm probably speaking too quickly for a play-by-play. They, they, uh, they're excited, but they're not fast-paced. They, they speak in a measured tone. Uh, so play-by-play announcers need to be knowledgeable and have the ability to recall minute facts and trivia at a moment's notice. So we talked about making up trivia for the teams, and that's perfectly fine. So you know, take some notes, make up some background for some of these people, and just you know, we don't need a whole, we don't need a long story about each player. But if there's something interesting about somebody, just you can kind of blurt it out. And uh, you know, as the you know the quarterback's taking the snap, let us know that he broke his finger last year and he's recovering that, or that he you know, he's a football player who's been. Uh, who's been scouted by, you know, 20 colleges, but he really wants to go into the military or something like that. You know, just little things that you might know from him if you, if you just took, took the time to talk to him before the game. So um, we talked earlier about pr- pronouncing names, and you need to be familiar enough with the names that you can pronounce them uh, as the action's being called. Because you don't know... You don't know because it's a live sporting event. You don't know who's going to make the big play or who you're going to have to talk about it when. So you need to have all the names figured out. And everybody pronounces, depending on your region, you know, you can really pronounce names differently. You know, I'm from East Texas, and there we had a lot of people. Uh, I, have, I knew a family where they pronounced their name Hebert, but, you know, the same family in Louisiana, they're A-Bears, you know. So... We don't really care how you pronounce the name as long as you do it consistently. Um, if this were a real world game, you would go in and, and you would ask the players for the pronunciations if they're difficult, and you would make a note. This is how you say this name. Um, you know, my name's been mispronounced most of my life, and it doesn't really bother me because I'm used to it. So uh, it doesn't matter to me at all. But and most people are like that. But uh, if you're pronouncing names, we just need to make sure that they are consistent. Consistency is what matters. You only be switching every every time you mention a different player. Okay, so these are some more tips that I gathered from AmericanSportsCastersOnline.com, and uh, contestants can go there and find some more resources about about broadcasting games. And uh, this is something that that I I have seen when judging this contest. Don't call numbers. Call names and call them often. So we're talking about the numbers on the backs of the players, you know, their uniform numbers. Don't say, number six made a great play there. Know who number six is and say his name. Uh, that's who, you know, that's the way games are called. And we don't, we don't want to identify people by their numbers. We want to call them by who they are. So give the score every time scores, every time someone scores, and give the time often. Remember, the only thing the listener really needs to know is what's the score, who's leading, how much time is left on the clock. 
what quarter or inning is it? So that's what people need to know. Repeat the scores often. Uh, and in games that do have time to follow basketball, you know, let us know how much time is left. And uh, describe the gym, feel, et cetera. Describe the crowd. Why is the game important? And, and those, these are the kind of things we can kind of make up. It's like, why is the game important? You know, let people know if it's, for a, a, if it's just a rivalry or if it's a, for a title or something like that. Uh, describe the action. And there's, they want you to use descriptive phrases. Uh, and they're saying, like, pulls the trigger, lets it fly, and three if it goes when the ball is shot. And they're talking about basketball, you know. And it's important to let people know where the ball is shot from in basketball. Is it at the top of the key? Is it, you know, uh, to the, is it at the, uh, at the, you know, does it, the catch happen at the sideline of the football field? Things like that. Be descriptive. And, Sometimes people have, you know, kind of catchphrases they they use, uh, especially in baseball. You know, somebody might say, "Oh, that's a real humdinger or something for a home run," and it's stuff that's kind of funny, kind of goofy, but it catches your attention and it becomes uh, it becomes something people expect. So, you know, these guys can maybe the uh, some of the sports commenta commentary, uh, sports broadcasting contestants can kind of make up their own make up their own uh, kind of catchphrases if they want. That could be a fun way to just personalize the, the broadcast. Uh, <clears throat> this is important. Uh, don't be critical of a call, and this is a call from an official, unless you're sure that the ref blew it or the umpire blew it. And then in that case, be kind. Um, you know, we're not here to criticize the officials. We're here just to, to talk about the game and what happens. And, you know, uh, it's hard to know for sure, unless you know, unless you have replay, like immediately after a play, it's hard to know, you know, if the ref or umpire really did mess up a call. And uh, so it's best not to talk, to spend too much time on that. Spend time on the action. Um, and this says always set the defense. And this is in in the kind of you know in football and basketball is very important about. Uh, describe the defense. You know, sports fans are familiar with uh, how, especially basketball, how it's been played. If it's in a zone or if it's a man-to-man, -man. and uh, you know, in offenses, especially in football, you can kind of say the same way. There, the the offenses have names, and a lot of, a lot of football fans know the names of the offense. They know the they know the way the the team is set up before the play, and you should just call that out because to a lot of people, it, it lets them kind of know what what to expect in the action. If you can anticipate action, that's very helpful to people watching the game. Okay, and don't forget, call the score, call the score. It's really important, so always repeat the score, especially when people, when people do score, when they score a point, score a run, let them know. Um, okay, and like we talked about earlier, this year will be different. Uh, there in the past, you know, we would be sitting, the judges, there would be three judges sitting behind the uh, competitors and they would be just listening to them call the game. And, uh, and you know, that might be more uncomfortable for some people. You know, uh, being at home or in your 4-H agent's office or something like that, however we're going to do it this year, uh, that might be more comfortable for a lot of people because they might not feel the pressure. They might not realize they're even speaking to judges. They might be more, they might be loose and uh, very comfortable with that. But uh, this is what we're looking for, the rubric we're looking for. Do the contestants speak clearly? Okay. Are they pronouncing words correctly? And we're not necessarily talking about the names of the players. We're talking about just the words they're using in the, to describe the action. Um, are the contestants speaking at an appropriate rate and volume? So not too slowly, not too quickly, and loud enough that we can understand you. And we want, we want people to be enthusiastic. We want people to show their passion for the game and you know, sound excited. Uh, it's important that the contestants work as a team, that they work well together, and uh, they, kinda, they do have to get together either on video chat or in person if possible 
you know, I, I don't know if we're if we're going to be able to do that, but they need to be able to work together and kind of have signals about when they talk. In the past, if they if the two contestants were sitting together in the room, they could kind of signal to one another uh, with their with their mannerisms or their with a head nod, and let people let the other one know, hey, you know, I think it's time for you to say a little something. And uh, they need to make sure that their words complement each other, that the that they kind of go seamlessly back and forth. The play-by-play uh, broadcaster can mention a play, and then the uh, color commentator can go right back and describe the play, and they can use the same language to describe it. They the color commentator shouldn't be speaking a completely different language from the play-by-play guy. You know, they should be working together and complementing one another. Okay. And uh, accuracy. Do the contestants demonstrate knowledge of the game? It is important to know the game. We talked about this before. The each each game has a vocabulary. Each game has a set of rules that they should be familiar with. Um, and these games that we're going to be watching are mostly you know, high school games from the past. And uh, there's not going to be some kind of odd rule that comes up that they're not familiar with. You know, that if you're familiar with the game, these are, these are basic games. You know, every once in a while you watch a pro game and there will be some kind of call that some kind of rule come up that you've never heard of before and that most fans don't even know about. Um, so, uh, but they need to know the basics of the game, right? And uh, they need to make accurate calls. When we talk about making things up, it's, you know, background of players, teams, that's great. Make that stuff up. But the actual calls, what's happening on the screen, uh, those need to be accurate. They need to be saying exactly what's happening. Uh, use sports terms correctly. Uh, use your knowledge of the game to make the comments interesting, especially for the color commentator. The color commentator needs to be very knowledgeable of the game and be able to just talk about uh, why a player or a coach would choose to do something. <clears throat> and uh, really take the viewers or listeners you know, inside the heads of those, of those players and coaches. And they need to be creative. Uh, we talked a little bit about being creative and you know, maybe making up a, a catchphrase or something like that. Um, the contestants have to be able to think on their feet. And this is the hardest part of this uh, of this contest. Uh, being able to call call the game as it's happening is really difficult, and we don't need a lot of what they call dead air, where uh, you, where there's just several seconds of silence. It's good to have a little bit of silence to let people watch the game if you're watching it, but. We don't need a lot of silence. You know, sometimes people need time to to take in what happened, but a lot of silence, five, six, seven seconds, is is kind of off putting to the listener, and we need to avoid that. Um, and they do need to be spontaneous. In the past, we've put out a roster before and the background about the team, and it was clear that from the broad from the contest, it was clear that. The contestants were able to go back and find an old, an old, that old game, and they were actually able to, to memorize what was happening, and they were following notes. We've had people come in with notes, and it's clear they were reading from their notes rather than watching the game, and uh, we tried to stop that from happening. But if we see that happening, if it's clear that it's happening, I mean, you're going to lose a lot of points for this, um, and people who were not as good at the at actually calling the game will probably do better. Um, visual speech. Do the contestants use speech to help the listener visualize the game? And you were telling people to try to do this like, like they're on the radio. So uh, describe everything you can. Uh, be, be, you know, make everything as visual as possible. And are these comments effective? That's what we're looking for is, uh, is whether or not the, the comments actually do work. Um, the because this is a pretty hard contest, you know, uh, we we don't expect people to sound like professionals, you know. But like if 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 people just do a good job play by play, and then they do a good job of 
explaining you know, the color commentary does a good job of just explaining a bit of of what he or she sees. I mean, that's what we're looking for, and that's what will get high marks. You know. Uh, now, um, I I found a couple of YouTube clips I would like to share um, in a minute, but it would probably be good to take some questions if anybody has any. Uh, are there any in the chat? I'm watching in right now. The chat is open. Okay. Uh, well, if we're uh, if y'all want to come up with some questions, I will. Uh, I want to show you what I think is kind of a funny commercial. Uh, Vin Scully did this commercial in 1995 for Los Angeles Dodgers games. They were sponsored by this company called Farmer John. And it's a California company. I've never heard of it other than through these broadcasts. But uh, they made ham, like really low-fat ham, too, that looks pretty gross to eat. But uh, I, I wanted to show the, uh, I wanted to show the, um, this video because I want the contestants to know kind of how the commercial should go at the end of the at the end of the contest, when you finish your eight minutes of, of broadcasting the sport, you're going to have to do a commercial for a product that we write a script for. And commercial broadcasts are very different from play-by-play -play because they're really over the top. You know, the, the commentator reads it like, it's a, like he's acting or he, or he or she is acting. And um, if you just watch the way Vin Skelly does it, he really puts a lot of feeling into it. He really is over the top. He... Uh, it's it's almost funny, but it's effective because this is how you read commercials. Okay, so I'm gonna cue this up, uh, and let's see. All right, I had it earlier, and it's kind of gone down the bottom of my screen. Where is it? Okay, here we are. Uh, all right, so this commercial is the one I'm talking about. It's uh, for Farmer John Ham from 1995. Farmer John, the tradition continues with another delectable idea. The Farmer John family of boneless hams, lean, tender, and juicy, slice after slice. All fully cooked and boneless and 97% fat-free with the same smoked savory western flavor that has made Farmer John a tradition in Southland homes for over three generations. No other ham canned or packaged can match the rich, robust flavor of these boneless hams. A tradition of choice from Farmer John. Okay, so uh, that's kind of, uh, yeah, that's the best case scenario, really, for uh, delivering a commercial. Were you able to hear that okay? Okay. Um, yes, we heard it. Okay, thanks. <laughs> I forget that y'all are on mute mostly. Yeah, uh, yeah, so that's kind of the best case scenario that we're looking for with the commercial. Um, and, um, I also had a uh, another broadcast that I might want to show the uh, the radio broadcast from the the Peach Bowl this past year uh, LSU play against Oklahoma, and you can hear them introducing the this you know the talking about the location, talk about the uniforms, talk about everything, and that's kind of the way what how we want people to introduce the broadcast is you know uh, in the competition we want you to be able to discuss the, the setting. So uh, if anybody has any questions, we can do that now or we can. Um, OK, so I'll go ahead and cue that up. the Tigers, Chris Blair. Thank you, Doug. All right, Tiger fans, college football playoff. 
Chick-fil-A Peach Bowl opening kickoff brought to you by Centos, helping Louisiana businesses stay clean, safe, and ready for the workday for over 35 years. Boot meets ball. We're underway in Atlanta. Avery Atkins once again about seven yards deep into the end zone. Trey Brown will call for the fair catch, take a knee. It'll be a touchback, and Oklahoma will get started on offense from their own 25-yard line. Doug told you, today's team colors, LSU in their traditional, Oklahoma in their maroon jerseys, white pants. Team colors of the game brought to you by Haspel. No better looking team in America than the LSU Fighting Tigers. Look your best by going to Haspel.com. 15 minutes put up on the board. Jalen Hurts, senior out of Houston, Texas, will line up the Sooners along with Kennedy Brooks. He'll be the single back. To the right side of Hertz. Send out one receiver to the left, one to the right side. Here's the snap on first and 10 from the 25. A little pressure. Jalen gets away momentarily, but then staying with the play, Caleb on Chassaw comes in, brings him down for his fifth sack of the season. Oklahoma held him at bay for as long as they could. They picked him up, but he shrugged off that block and then brought Hertz down. Now, um, if you're listening, the... Uh... The commentators, they get really creative just describing the kickoff, and they have a kind of a catchphrase, boot meets ball. And uh, if you listen to them regularly, they, they employ this in most games. And uh, if you notice in this broadcast, everything is sponsored by something. You know, the kickoff is brought to you by a sponsor. Even the description of the uniforms was brought to you, sponsored by a uniform company. And, you know, we really don't expect our competitors to do this kind of thing because you know, it, it, they only have eight minutes and they, you know, they don't really need to like make up advertisers for this kind of stuff because they'll have their hands full really just calling the action. But for these professionals, they just kind of throw it in there fairly seamlessly and they, you know, make a little money for the radio station too. But uh, it's almost tempting just to keep watching this game because it's, it's a pretty good one. Uh, but uh, that's kind of, and I, I've included this uh, this broadcast in the PowerPoint so people can do control and click and open it up because uh, you know these guys are pros and they're calling one of the most important games you know LSU has played in recent years and uh, to this point and uh, there's a lot of pressure on them but they do a good job of it you know and. Uh, Pretty much everything we heard there was the play-by-play -play guy. Um, but Okay, um, are there any questions that have come up in the chat or anything anybody wants to know about this contest? Um, looks clear now, but it looks like we definitely have some youth here on the call. Uh, I definitely encourage you guys to ask any questions. Um, I'm going to drop his email in the, in the chat. That way you can contact him directly, but uh, I'll leave the floor open right now. Okay, great. Yeah, that's a great idea. If you think of questions later, email me for sure, um, and uh, and I'll, I'll do my best to, to get you the best answer possible. Okay. Um, in the past, uh, the, the the former superintendent for this contest would play a recording from a, a national public radio show about uh, like sports public address announcers and how they call the games. Um, Robert, do you think it would be okay to play that now, or should I just include it in the resources that that they have in uh, in Teams or that you that you have? I I'd say do both. Okay. Yeah, so I'll play that, and I've, I've only listened to it once, and it's not really about play-by-play -play for the radio or for, for TV, but it, it does give you a good idea of, like, of how they call games. And these are the people who call the games for, you know, just, you know, high school football and things like that. So you get a definite idea of, like, what's important when you're, when you're doing play-by-play. -play. Okay, so uh, I'll, I'll pull it up here. Soon at high schools across the country, Friday night will once again sound like this. 
Number 24, Jesse Hilber on the return for the Wildcats, tackled by number 77, Larry Pelk. Ball spotted at the wild and already football players are out on the field scrimmaging, but the players aren't the only ones who need practice. The announcer you just heard is Jeff Kurtz, and he was demonstrating his craft at a clinic that he runs in Hudson, Ohio. Dan Bobkoff of member station WCPN went to see what it takes to be the voice of the game. So, you want to be a PA announcer? Jeff Kurtz says there are a few things you need to know. You are not a radio guy. You're not a play-by-play -play announcer. You're not a color man or a color woman. You're a public address announcer. Kurtz is the announcer at many Kent State University games. That means he's the voice for the fans in the stands. On this Saturday, he's in the Hudson High School Library training announcers young and old, experienced and novice on the finer points of the craft. I'm gonna need people to come up in pairs. One of you will serve as a spotter and one will serve as the public address announcer. Among the most enthusiastic and the youngest is 13-year-old Jordan Walker. He's the first to volunteer to call a practice game off a videotape. Hooper takes the snap. He hands it off to Smith, and he's tackled it around the 35-yard line. Smith Let's give a round very round. Nice job. Clearly, this kid Walker is going places. He's already calling youth baseball games and wants this to be his career. One, I talk a lot, and two, I like sports, so I'm thinking, okay, I probably don't have much of a shot at being an athlete because that's like a one in a million, so why not still be at the games for free and get to call the games and actually get paid to be at the games? But most of the men and women here happily do it for free. Best seat in the house. Jim Munt of Maumee, Ohio, has been calling high school games for 40 years and says the announcer often gets the best view and a guaranteed ticket. Either through heat or cold or rain or snow, you're there and, and that's, that's great protection. What more of a comfort seat is than that? Munt has been to every clinic he can get to. They're offered by the National Association of Sports Public Address Announcers, and he says they really help him refine his skills. There's the practical advice, like make sure your roster is taped down in case there's a gust of wind. Keep a bullhorn in case the power goes out. And write the names of the players phonetically, or else you'll get some angry parents coming to your booth. But clinic leader Kurt says some professional sports announcers are becoming showmen. He's more of a purist. He says an announcer at a high school game doesn't need to be boring, but shouldn't attract attention. Because the focus is supposed to be on the student athletes and on the game, not on all that extraneous stuff. And as the announcers practice at this clinic, some like Andy Mark are mindful of how hard it is. Yeah, he's looking fast, this is the right side. Cut! Uh, I, I can't tell where the ball went. <laughs> I can't. I can't tell what happened or not. Kurtz's last piece of advice is one broadcasters of every stripe should remember. The microphone is always on. For NPR News, I'm Dan Bobkoff in Cleveland. Okay, yeah, that has a few of the basics. Uh, I'll, I'll share that with you, Robert, so you can put it with all the other resources so we can, yeah, it, it uh, has a few of the basics and it also gives you an idea of how, how difficult this can be sometimes. Uh, now, for me, you know, I didn't cover sports when I was a newspaper reporter very much, but I did cover it occasionally and really, uh, I would sit next. I would go into a to a uh, press box at a football field and sit next to the PA announcer, and I just thought, man, this guy's had, this guy's a hard job. And they would usually have a guy with them with binoculars who's a spotter, who's calling out, who's like giving him notes about like you know who play, who the players are, what's happening, because he has a hard time with it. So, um, but it's really hard just to see the action and call it accuracy accurately as it happens. It's it's a very hard job. So, you know, I, I think it's cool that uh, anybody wants to compete in this because it is difficult and it's fun and it's creative and it might turn you on to a, a career that you've, uh, that you've never really thought about in sports journalism or sports broadcasting. Um, so uh, I'll check the chat real quick and still don't see any more questions. Okay, here's a question. All right. All right. Are the games our contestants calling do with everything else on June twelfth? Um, you know, uh, 
I, I'm not positive about that right now, but I, I will figure that out. Uh, Robert, do you do you have any idea about that? Like what kind of games they want to call football, baseball, uh, basketball, softball? Do they need to make that decision on June 12th, by June 12th? Uh, so I'm looking in the rules right now. Uh, just to make sure I have the concept right. Um, one second. And this is being done so live, right? Yeah, it's gonna be done live. Yeah, so they just so have to they just have to decide what game they're gonna call. So there's no uploading of anything on this contest, correct? Right. Yeah, it's all done live. Yeah. Yeah, so um, Hilton, I would say since there's nothing that needs to be uploaded or submitted uh, for this contest, I say they'd be good uh, up until the, the actual day of the contest, yeah. since there's no pre-submissions here. Yeah, uh, but but the the earlier they decide, you know, then they'll uh, that the longer they'll get to spend with the roster, which is like, uh, you know, which is really all they're going to be able to work with is kind of the background info and the roster that we give them. So uh, uh, so it would be good to do I'll, it earlier. I guess also to just go piggyback off of Hilton's question, I think the reason why he's asking this question is um, because you are, you will send them like the roster. Mm -hmm. So I'm assuming you're going to just, if, if we can, we'll, we'll put in a, in a, um, in the contest site, a, um, a link to allow them to choose which contest um, it can be the week when we'll decide me and Kyle and Robert as far as if it's going to be the June 12th date or it can be the the week of the contest so they can get that um, those rosters the week of the contest yeah okay thank you Xavier yeah um, we'll uh, it would be good for them to go ahead and make up their minds but uh, we'll we'll make that you know We'll make that certain soon. We'll make that decision today. Uh, Hayden asked, uh, will we choose the basketball game we call? Yeah, we'll choose it because uh, we'll only have, like, my plan is to have, like, four clips. I can't, I can't gather a ton of clips. And it has to be a clip that you've never, that I hope you've never seen before. So uh, we'll choose the games. And it, you know, it, it should be a clip you've never seen before. That way, when you see it on the screen the day of the contest, that's the first time you've seen it because it has to be a live call. That's important for the, the contest, for it to be totally live. Yeah, uh, yeah. We'll, I think it's a good idea to have them, uh, Jeannie, to have, the, uh, to have the games they want to choose due on June 12th. So, uh, in the past, you know, there's usually been basketball, baseball, or football. So uh, I'm probably going to stick with that. And uh, I'm trying to do softball, too. I just have to be able to get a good video for that. So I'll, uh, I should have that done today or early next week, and I'll, I'll let you know. We'll, let, we'll make sure that you all know that information. Okay, yeah, all good questions. These are, these are, yeah, like I said before, this is my first time to be superintendent of this uh, contest. So there are some things I'm kind of straightening out as I go. And uh, doing it all virtually has been an extra little curveball. Sure. Hey, you're welcome. Uh, I think. Just a moment. I think it's great that uh, I, anything 4-H, 4 Hers want to do, I really appreciate it because I think they're really bright kids and. Uh, 4-H does a lot for them to help them learn, so uh, I'm glad to help. Okay. Uh, any other questions anybody has? Okay. Well, uh, we've been on here almost an hour, uh, 49 minutes, so uh, if nobody has any more questions, uh, we might log off here, but feel free to give me an email. Uh, I think uh, Robert was going to send out my email, or I can put it here if you all would like. I want to drop it here. Okay. All 
All right, thank you, Robert. Um, yeah, so that's just kpvito at accenter.lsu.edu, and I check that, you know, twenty four seven on my on my phone, probably more than I should. So uh, I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Um, and yeah, we should have all the information about how many clips are available, like how many sports, very soon. But it will definitely be uh, basketball, football, and baseball. But uh, I would like to include softball, but I. I can't use old clips because of the new setup, so I have to find some new ones. So uh, we'll definitely let we'll definitely get that nailed down in the next couple of days. So I appreciate y'all uh, uh, attending the training, and uh, I really appreciate everything the agents do for the 4-Hers out there. All right, have a great weekend, guys.